Thanks. That was great. I am Bob. I am an alcoholic and an addict. I assume in the interest of mental health, that's a sugar-free cake. <laughs> I don't even want to think about being stuck in a hotel with 2,000 alcoholics and a cake full of sugar. No, stay, stay down the street. Um, everything I say up here is my opinion, unless I read directly from the book. My opinion has been known to cause people, some people, distress. <laughs> which I always find amusing. Be, because it's just an opinion. And there's every chance I might even change it after the meeting. So while you're up pacing completely nuts, I'm saying to myself, oh, I wonder if I believe that. So what I say is just my opinion. I'm supposed to share my experience, strength, and hope. Not an experience, strength, and hope that doesn't put you under stress. You know? So if my experience, strength, and hope puts you under stress, <laughs> talk to your sponsor. I'm one of those who was um, emotionally disturbed before I ever drank. Seriously, emotionally disturbed before I ever drank. And opinions were difficult for me, too, people with opinions, because I grew up in a house where there was only one opinion, ever. And all other opinions were wrong. And, and that caused me a lot of trouble in early recovery, too, because I did, never understood the concept that you and I can have a different opinion about a topic and neither one of us are wrong. I just, I couldn't get it. I wasn't raised that way. I was raised where if you're wrong, uh, I'm right. And if I'm wrong, you're right. And that's it, you know, and that's how it goes. And so uh, if you have an opinion different than mine and, and, and yours seems to be the popular one, then I have to change because it makes me wrong. So opinions were always tough for me for a long, long time in recovery. I, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm the product of an alcoholic father and a, um, a child batterer for a mother, uh, a award-winning child batterer for a mother. She used her fist, broke my nose, tore out the corners of my eyes. She did a lot of damage. No wonder I had a little trouble with relationships when I got sober. <laughs> but no one was around at that time to point that out to me as I kept going through wives with a very uncomfortable frequency. <laughs> So anyhow, um, at 15, they threw me out of a high school in Los Angeles called Manual Arts. And they sent me to a high school that used to be there called Jacob Reese. And Jacob Reese was for people like me. And, and um, to give you an idea as to how disturbed I was, uh, I lasted. Uh, there was not, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there was an educational credential at Jacob Reese in anybody. I think they, most of them were either juvenile police officers or retired juvenile police officers. And, and basically their job was just to keep us there for the day, you know, off the streets for seven hours and then let the animals back out. I lasted one day in Jacob Reese High School and they called my mother and said, we don't want him in the Los Angeles Skitty school system. My mother said, well, what about that continuation program? Maybe I can get him a job and he can go on weekends. They said, no, you're not understanding what we're saying. We do not want this boy in the Los Angeles City School System. What had happened was this. As a little boy, I had an attention deficit disorder. Well, I still have it. But, but, but because I was getting my ass kicked in and, and I had this disorder that made it difficult for me to learn, I was very slow in school, really slow. But I had a very high IQ. And in those days, if you had a high IQ and you were slow, they thought you were doing it intentionally to um, just be a trouble. So I was embarrassed and humiliated a lot in school. And when I was 14, I hit six feet and everything changed between me and my instructors. <laughs> we had a different relationship, which is one of the reasons they asked me to leave Los Angeles City School System. So there I was, 15 years of age, could not function in the school system. I hadn't drank. I didn't know anything about drinking or using yet. It was to be three days from then. And I was down in Hermosa Beach and somebody gave me a marijuana cigarette and a half gallon jug of red wine to wash it down with. 
if there's anyone out there that does not know what happened, you came through the wrong door. (laughs) Up to that point in my life, I can only remember being uncomfortable in my body, really uncomfortable in my body, feeling inadequate, insufficient, incomplete, and like there was a little tiny uh, bubbling uh, pot of sewage down inside of me. And my role in life was to make sure you never found that little pot of sewage. Um, I discovered now, I know it has a name, it's called shame. And that if you did discover it, one of three things would happen. You'd make me go away, you'd go away, you'd call the attention of others to it and embarrass me and humiliate me. So I had lived under that pressure for 15 years and that marijuana, cigarette and wine fixed all that in a matter of moments. In a matter of moments, I was comfortable in my body. The little pot of sewage was gone. I no longer felt inadequate or insufficient or incomplete. Girls took on a whole new meaning to me on the beach that day. Um, The the sand was no longer an irritant, you know, to me. Um, It was like life was okay suddenly. And for the next three years, for me, it was magic. I I mean, I loved it. It saved my life. It was the answer. It was the answer. I do not believe I could have lived um, had I not discovered substances of some kind to calm the inner disturbance that I was experiencing. It was just too much. My mind was going too fast. And just, you know, I could create worlds of anguish in my head in seconds. And um, then I'd have to anesthetize it. So... The thing I liked about drugs and alcohol in the beginning was I was a bit of an amateur chemist and I used to take down pharmaceutical warehouses because I have a thing about germs so I wouldn't shoot heroin from Mexico. (laughs) And I knew morphine was pharmaceutically clean and pure and so it was easier to take down a pharmaceutical warehouse and take off cases of morphine, go buy some Jack Daniels, get a little few other combinations and get up in the morning and I could tell you who I was going to be when I left the house. I mean, I had that kind of control over my life. I've always wanted control over my life. And for once, I had it. I could, I could feel what I wanted to feel. I could stop the feelings I didn't want to feel. I could tell you if I was going to be moving with the speed of light when I left the house, or if I was going to be going rather slow, sort of a paper slipper shuffle out the door, you know? <laughs> And then, of course, after three years, there's most of you, I'm sure, know what happened. One day it turned on me. It didn't work. I felt just as bad as I felt before I got loaded. Just as bad. And that was that. And then it was eight years trying to recapture one moment. Eight years of misery. I think that's the period for most of us in our alcoholism where... Um, non-addicted, non-alcoholic friends and neighbors say to us, well, if it did that to me, I'd quit. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and how do you say, wait a minute, I'm looking for one, I know what's there, I know what's in it, I'm looking for that one day, one more time, all I want is to feel that one more time. Wound up in uh, Pasadena's small but unique skid row at 26 years of age. Weighed about 135 pounds, I weigh 200 now, if you want to know what I look like, about 65 pounds lighter. Living in doorways, you know, before it was fashionable. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I don't know why I was in Pasadena. I've never figured out why I was in Pasadena. I have no idea. The only conclusion I've been able to come up with over the years um, is that I had no respect for their police department. And I guess I knew I was so sick that I needed to be where the law enforcement I didn't feel was intelligent. So... Uh, <laughs> I guess that's why I was there. I don't know. Um, I wound up in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because God loves me and sent the necessary Eskimos to take me to my first meeting of AA. And um, I didn't like meetings either. I I wasn't comfortable in meetings, particularly in Pasadena. We had a little communication problem. Um, I had grave mental and emotional disorders and, you know, they had passed out on the 18th green at the country club and embarrassed themselves, you know, and... (laughs) And gotten sober, so we were we were in a different state of mind in the meeting while it was going on. You know, we started responding differently to the speakers as they were talking. They were thrilled, and I wanted to kill them because they were boring me. <laughs> we have a saying. We have we have we have gotten a lot of sayings in AA over the years, which I just love because they're not written anywhere. 
And, and yet they're spoken as if they're gospel, as if they're chisel in the mountain, you know. One of my favorites is don't get emotionally involved. Why not? I can only assume there, that saying originated with someone who had difficulty with relationships and figure, you know, I'm not getting laid, you're not getting laid, you know. Uh, um, So God knew exactly how to save my life. I was three weeks sober living with these two guys, painting their house in order to, you know, earn my keep. So they asked me to give a 10-minute talk at this meeting, three weeks sober, and I gave my 10-minute talk. And in the audience was um, ex-Rose Princess from Pasadena. They're a little darling, and they were so happy with her that they had a sober Rose Princess. She had three months on the program. What story I'm telling you is true, and there's, you know, 50 witnesses to it. She came up to me after the meeting and told me that her sponsor had told her that if she heard anything she liked at an AA meeting, to take it home. <laughs> it seemed like an outstanding idea to me. <laughs> you know. You know, then, of course, I was the target of all their slings and arrows because I would deflower their damn rose princess, you know. <laughs> this, this animal head, you know. And we were together about a week, and it was great, and then she had a complete emotional collapse and, and wound up in a private psychiatric hospital. And, and that was not, that didn't upset me maybe as much as it should have because I kind of figured from the beginning that sober sex would be something like that, you know, that, that, you, that you'd meet and you'd have a lot of passion and then one day you would lose your mind and, and be put away. Um. I didn't know what the hell to do, so I just went to visit her every day and I took the big book. And get well cards. I didn't have a sponsor yet. I didn't have anybody to talk to. And yes, I know get well cards are not really considered, you know, pro appropriate for mental patient, but I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> I meant well. My heart was in the right place. <laughs> and she was too nuts to notice, so it was okay. So we used to sit by the swimming pool in this my private psychiatric hospital, this swanky joint, and plan the rest of our lives together with God, AA, and the 12 steps. Yeah. Made sense to the two of us. She got out. We stayed together. And all together, I'll, I imagine we were together about, we got married at one point. It, <laughs> that was just, you know, one of those marriages to try and change everything. It's like you're in the battlefield and, you know, maybe a ceasefire will come if you get married. <laughs> That's really good logic. I've always loved that logic. My intuition told me not to do it, but I wasn't raised in a way to understand my intuition or listen to it. You know, I remember going up the aisle and my, my little intu intuitive voice was saying to me, um, this is not a good idea. <laughs> and I just said, oh, shut up, you know. I'm, uh, she's beautiful and I'm not complete without somebody on my arm and so, you know, this is the right thing to do. I do. <laughs> we had one of those marriages where we probably, I don't know how many times we separated, somewhere between six and eight times. I mean, enough that, you know, sponsors and friends had said, if you go back together one more time, we'll never speak to you again. <laughs> so, of course, we did, you know, I mean, it just, it was mandatory that we do that. And then for some strange reason, we didn't see each other for about 10 years, although we were both sober in Southern California. Our paths just never crossed. And about 10 years later, I went to speak at a, a at Milano club in Burbank. It's half the size or more than half the size of this room. And I'm like in one corner, but I come in a door like at the front in one corner. And she's clear back in the far corner. And we see each other. And we go across this Milano club like a Clairol ad, you know, just running <laughs> towards uh, towards each other and we just kind of entwine and at the, at the same moment we said the identical thing we both said thank you for being part of saving my life 
because we realized then, 10 years later, how important we were to each other. She had no mechanism to distinguish people. She could have asked a, a serial rapist to be her sponsor and wouldn't pick up any bad vibrations. You know, she was just that out of touch. She trusted everybody. I trusted no one. My self-esteem was in the toilet. I did not know how to take care of myself or do things for me. I could do it for others. And that's what God had provided me with, another to do it for. So I would read the book every night for us. I mean, for her. I'd, you know, read the 24-hour-a-day book every morning for her. I'd see that we got to a meeting every night for her. I'd see that we read the 12 and 12 for her. So for like 18, 19 months, I was helping keep her sober. That was my thing. Of course, I stayed sober in the process. That was God's. That was God's gift to me. That relationship. So I'm one that's sort of more uh, uh, a proponent of getting emotionally involved um, early on. I think one of the things that helps is that you'll spend more time with your sponsor if you're in a relationship. <laughs> You might get by with two or three calls a week, you know, without a relationship. With a relationship, it'll be more like two or three calls a day. (laughs) So that's a that's a good reason to. Well, what am I talk about? It it was an interesting experience for me. I've been sober and clean for um, over thirty-four years. It's been quite an adventure. Yeah. So you must understand that what I say has great validity for me, even if it has none for you. Um, it was tough for me. I didn't like the people. Uh, I, I, um, I was nuts and getting nuts every day. I mean, each day I was sober, I got crazier, plain and simple. And no one else was. And no one else was talking about it. And everyone was fine. No matter what happened to them, they were fine. When the greeter shook their hand, they were fine. Even if their dog had just died and their car had been repossessed. You know, they were fine. Everybody was fine. And I don't want to be exposed. So I'm fine. How are you, Bob? I'm fine. Thank you. (laughs) Having a small problem with anger, but I'll work it out. (laughs) It seems to be somehow connected to my ignition key. I can remember being eight years clean and sober, meditating for four hours every morning, getting up at four o'clock in the morning to meditate for four hours. I I like meditation. I I learned a kind of meditation that taught me medication. That's a good one. (laughs) It was medication for me because I learned, you know, a third eye, leave your body meditation. And I love leaving my body. It's always been the least favorite residence for me, you know. uh, (laughs) So a meditation that took me out, I'm compulsive and obsessive. If you do not know what compulsive and obsessive means, it means that we can take something that's good for us and kill ourselves with it. So <laughs> when I quit smoking, I took up running. I don't run now. I walk because I have no knees left. Because, <laughs> you know, it's logic. It's a, if, if two miles a day is great, three is better. Hell, five, five miles a day is really good. Look at ten. This is cool. Hell, we can run 15 a day and do a marathon on the weekend for something to do. <laughs> Until we're taken to the emergency hospital at the end of the marathon. But that's how I like to do things, <clears throat> or used to. Anyway, I need that intensity in order to pay attention, to focus. That's part of, that's part of what an attention deficit disorder is. So I was having a lot of stress. I mean, I was chasing people through the streets of Los Angeles at 100 miles an hour because they didn't use their turn signal, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, my head hanging out the window, my hair blowing in the wind, foam coming out of my mouth as I scream obscenities. And I could do all that, pull in the parking lot outside the meeting, you know, brush my hair, wipe off the foam, and, you know, walk in, and the greeter would say, hey, Bob, hi, how are you? I'd say, fine, thanks, how are you? Because nobody else was talking about chasing people through the streets at 100 miles an hour, and I was not going to be the first. I eventually wound up being the first, but that was only because I was going to die if I didn't say something. I've never chosen, I didn't choose to be controversial in AA. It wasn't my idea. I didn't say, hey, God, I'd like to piss off about one-third of AA and make them really mad. You know, so mad they can't even see straight. That they change colors when they hear my name. (laughs) 
So all I've done is share the truth about who I am, and that just grinds some people the wrong way. I left California about 12 years ago for about 10 years. I was gone about 10 years in Arizona and New Mexico. And when I left California, it was everything, everything was happening. It was great. It was a lot of fun. ACA was up and running like a wildfire. A lot of people were going to meetings and getting some help. Um, CODA was up and running. A lot of AAs had started to go to Al-Anon to, to get some more information. There was a lot of um, workshops and conferences available with professional speakers talking on those issues that are important to some alcoholics. And so I thought, coming back after 10 years, I thought, this will be, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. I mean, this has got to be really exciting to get back there and see where they brought all this after 10 years. <laughs> Man, I don't know what happened, but, you know, I come back and everybody's uh, nuts with stuff, you know? Oh, he's an addict. We don't talk to addicts. That's an alcoholic. We don't, you know, we don't talk about sober here. You know, I'm like, what, what, wait. <laughs> When I left here, there was a lot of uh, inclusion going on. You know, it wasn't exclusive. It was we were being inclusive. We were including people. It was it was opening minds. Things were happening. I said, you know, I'm back here, and you're saying that crap. You cannot share unless it pertains directly to your alcoholism. I love that one. That one's from General Service, and I, and I don't know because I don't know anyone in General Service. That either they really missed the boat, or or that was a highly intelligent comment from them <laughs> because I don't know if I don't know if they know it or not but on I- I- any given occasion at any time anywhere in the world no matter who's in the room I am the only person in the room who is qualified to make the determination as to whether or not what I'm sharing about relates to my alcoholism. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and I'm not being a hard ass here. No one's qualified. Did you just not qualify to make that judgment when I share? I might be talking about my parakeet, you know, who died. And I might be really distressed, in grief, sobbing. And somebody's going to give me a load of crap about self-pity and a parakeet's got nothing to do with my sobriety. And you don't know what my relationship is with my parakeet. <laughs> You know, I mean, maybe when I first got sober, my parakeet was my higher power. You know? Maybe I used to sit at the birdcage and talk to God, and now my God, as I understand him, is dead. <laughs> so you have no right to criticize what I say in a meeting. <laughs> I love AA. Some people think I don't because of some of the things I say. But I say stupid things sometimes. You know, I, 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 get, I get strange or I forget to equate it to me and I equate it to everybody, you know. And, and it does irritate people. And then if they have a tendency to hang on to stuff, they clutch it to them for years, you know. Not assuming that I may have changed, you know. Or, well, of course, we do that here. We don't really judge people. We condemn them, you know. <laughs> I mean, some guy does something really stupid, and you come up and ask me about him ten years later, I say, oh, yeah, he's an idiot. I mean, ten years have passed. He might be a rocket scientist by this time. I don't know, you know. But I have condemned him. I have not judged him. (laughs) Well, um... AAs, I think that a lot of things they talk about a lot here are really important. Being of service, I think, is almost critical for those of us who are thinkers, you know. (laughs) Basically task oriented, you know, if your mind is going speed of light, if you don't need anyone else in the the room to help you create anxiety. um, (laughs) I I think being of service is good. And it can be difficult. And I think there's sometimes there's a, a, a misperception that you got to like it. 
because people get up and say, oh man, I got this panel in, uh, you know, Bolivia and it's great. You know, I fly down there every month and carry the message, although they don't understand English. <laughs> Let me tell you, you do not have to like it. The very first panel I was given, I was six months sober and it was in the Los Angeles County Hospital. And um, I told you I have a thing about germs anyway, right? So, you go down to the hospital, you go meet in this room, and they give you a book. And in the book is the names of all the patients on the floor. And they, what they've done is the doctors have marked who's there as a result of alcoholism. And even if it's a broken leg, and there's nothing about, you know, it's not like cirrhosis or, or, or something else. If it's a broken leg and the guy was drinking, the doctors had wrote in HBD, you know, had been drinking. So we know to go talk to them. So I'm there, I'm in the hospital, I don't like the hospital, you know, I get my little book, I go down the hall, I, I turn the corner, I walk in the room, and, and Joe, I, I was my first patient, client, whatever he was, Joe had been living outdoors for probably 20 years, he's laying there in the bed digging at like open wine sores on his body, you know, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> There was nothing about he's my brother, let me tell you. you know? <laughs> so I stand back, you know, from the bed so my clothes don't touch or anything, you know. I say, hi, I'm Bob. I'm here from Alcoholics Anonymous. He's laying there. He goes, hi, I'm Joe. And he sticks his hand up. <laughs> now Joe wants to shake hands. <laughs> And all I can hear is my sponsor's voice saying, on any given occasion, you may be the only example of AA a man will ever see. Be the best example you can. So I shake hands with Joe, and then I talk to him with my arm out here, like away from my clothes. <laughs> for the next ten minutes. And then I get out of there, man. I'm on a dead run down the hall to the bathroom. You know, right, right past the soap for the general public to the surgical soap. <laughs> I got to where I would be washing my hands about 35 times a night. I'd be, I was nuts. I was insane on that panel. I get in my car after and I think, God, I can't touch my steering wheel. I'm going to have to touch it in the morning when I'm clean. You know, and I'd get a rag and I'd drive home with a rag on the wheel. <laughs> but I showed up every week, you know, and it was great because I wasn't thinking when I was there. I was so nuts about the germs that, <laughs> that you know... I was perfectly happy. <laughs> so I did the panels, and I, you know, spoke, and I did a, a, all the things that AA and my sponsors were asking me to do, and, and it kept me sober. Kept me sober. S surrendering to God is difficult for me. I do it, and it's easier now, but I'm what's called a task-oriented person. In other words, I must be doing something in order to have value, for me to have value. Um, an, ex an example would be, say, I, I go out to my refrigerator and I open it up and I look and there's no milk. And I close the door and say, I've got to go to the store and get milk. N now, to this point, we're okay. That's mental health. You know, I've recognized a need and, and, I, and I can take care of it. You know, I know the solution for the problem. I've identified the problem. I know the solution. Go to the store. What happens next is where we cross the line. I look at my watch and say, I've got to be back at 3. Well, I don't have to be back for a couple of hours, you know. But I've now put this time limit on myself. If I'm a worthwhile human being, I will get to the store, get milk, and get home by 3 o'clock. And well, you know what this sets me up for? Total lunacy in traffic. You know, in the store, I'm in the eight items or less line behind some broad with her checkbook and 14 items, you know. <laughs> and I want to just kill her. Yeah, and I'm completely insane because if I don't get home by 3, I have no value. I have failed one more time. So for me to surrender with that kind of energy process going on, it's been difficult. And usually I have to be stopped physically, either injured or really sick to surrender. And so five years I was really injured badly, my back. And so I surrendered. It was great. You know, I surrendered, got injured, and my life changed. And I became a writer. And for the next 12 years I wrote and produced television and got married and divorced and made lots of money. And at 17 years... Um, I could have been a poster for AA, you know? 
look at this kid from the streets with no education. Here he is, 17 years sober, um, uh, you know, a uh, staff writer on a hit television show, living in a penthouse at the beach, driving expensive cars, divorcing one gorgeous, expensive wife, moving in one young, gorgeous girlfriend, expensive. <laughs> I should have taken up gambling, let me tell you. No one can shop like, like a, a woman who's emotionally upset. And if she's shopping on the car of the person that upset her... <laughs> It's really vicious, you know. I used to say this one girl could slam dunk Rodeo Drive. So here I am, uh, 17 years clean and sober, riding, making money, living in a penthouse, driving nice cars. I mean, you know, didn't smoke anymore, was running. If you looked at me, you'd say, you know, I think I was a vegetarian. But then you look at my wife, you'd say, my God, he did it. Whatever it is, he did it. <laughs> one small problem. Every morning when I woke up, the only thing I could think about when I first opened my eyes was dying. I wanted to die. Not kill myself, die. It was a difference. It was a definite difference. I just wanted to lay down somewhere and die. That's all I wanted. And I would be at peace. Because the struggle was too great. I was 17 years sober and crazier than I was the day I came through the doors. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. Of course, the feelings were coming back, but I didn't know what they were. I hadn't been allowed to experience them since I was a child. They were beaten out of me, the capacity to identify them and express them. So uh, the only place I could think to go at 17 years was to a therapist. <clears throat> and I went into this therapist's office, and we sat down. This was the first session, you know, the free get acquainted, see if you like each other session. <laughs> And she said to me, um, you know, start with your childhood. Tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, well, I'm 15. They threw me out of manual arts and uh, alcohol and spent the next 11 years drinking, using, smuggling narcotics. And, you know, and I went into AA 17 years ago. And she said, um, I said, start with your childhood. You weren't born at 15. I looked at her and said, I don't remember it. And by this time, 17 years old, I'd written 32 inventories, 32 written inventories. I probably read these 32 different inventories to 11 different people. No one had ever said a thing about the fact that they started at 15 years of age. And the reason for that is it seems that we pick like-minded people. So my sponsors couldn't remember back either. You know, I was just drawn to them and they were drawn to me. I mean, we connected. Neither one of us had a childhood. Hey, hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let's go have coffee, you know, and talk about everything but our childhood, which we don't have. Because we're so when I said that um, I didn't have one, I couldn't remember it. She got this strange, eerie smile on her face. <laughs> By this point, I was a little cynical, needless to say, and I thought the smile was um, that she was going to call the Rolls Royce dealer when I left the office and <laughs> order the one with the full leather interior because she had somebody who was about to pay for it, you know. <laughs> Because we had already decided that I was so stressed out and over the line that I needed to come every day and I needed to be there for like two or three hours each day, every day in the beginning. I was gone. I was gone. 17 years sober and I was gone. So the beauty, the magic, and the power of AA was as nuts as I was, I did what they told me to do and I was still sober. So that crazy, I was still sober. And yeah, that's the beauty of it. Um, basically what she was trying to say to me with that smile was, if you stick this out with me, if you have the courage, I will be here in this room with you when you discover and meet the man you are as opposed to the man you have believed yourself to be for all these years. <laughs> and I'm delighted to say I had the courage to stick it out with her and we put a few years together, she and I. Changed my life forever, forever. Now, one of the interesting things I noticed when I came back to uh, California was that we've lost a lot of literature, apparently. It seems that what I'm hearing from some quarters that the only thing that matters anymore in AA is the first 164 pages of the big book. 
screw the 12 and 12 or, you know, any of the stories or anything else because those have all come after and they're not as sacred as the first 164 pages of the big book, which is, of course, discounting the sober experience of all those that had gone on and wrote after the original book was written. I think my, for me, that would be a lot of arrogance to discount what the other sober alcoholics contributed to our literature um, long after the book was written. Well, there's a lot of heat over therapy, uh, and you know, um, in a, a lot of controversy, a lot of controversy about some of the medications. I've heard people say at the podium, if you take Prozac, you're not sober. Um, no one is entitled to say that in AA, just so you know. You know. They are perfectly entitled to say, if I took it, I would not consider myself sober. That's, that's cool. You can say that. So there's a lot of heat over all the medications that have to do with the neurotransmitters, too, so, and therapy. So what, for those of you who maybe perhaps who have, like, I had fired babies that had gone to therapy. So when I went, it was, you know, it was humble pie for me, you know. <laughs> But that's how my God usually works. You know, I make some monumental speech and then I wind up eating cow shit, you know. <laughs> works for me, though. It gets my attention every time, you know. Rarely do I find a need to repeat the same situation. <laughs> so for you um, who may have been giving some people a bad time about therapy or telling us how it's not part of recovery, um, I'd like to just read to you for a minute, if I may, a- out of this. I'm assuming we all know what this is. <laughs> I'm going to read from page 133. If you're bad at math, that is within the first sacred 164 pages. <clears throat> now about health. A body badly burned by alcohol does not often recover overnight, nor do twisted thinking and depression vanish in a twinkling. We are convinced that a spiritual mode of living is a most powerful health restorative. We who have recovered from serious drinking are miracles of mental health. But we have seen remarkable transformations in our bodies. Hardly one of our crowd now shows any mark of dissipation. But this does not mean that we disregard human health measures. God has abundantly supplied this world with fine doctors, psychologists, and practitioners of various kinds. I don't even want to guess at what Bill meant by practitioners of various kinds. I don't even... I don't want to touch that one. Seeing seeing as he and Arthur Ford, the psychic, were buddies before Arthur got sober, and that he and Dr. Bob used to play a Ouija board after the meetings... I can't even imagine what he meant by practitioners of various kinds. Now here it gets really unclear. Do not hesitate to take your health problems to such persons. Most of them give freely of themselves that their fellows may enjoy sound minds and bodies. Try to remember that though God has wrought miracles among us, we should never belittle a good doctor or psychiatrist. Their services are often indispensable in treating a newcomer and in following his case afterwards. In fact, before they published the book, they gave it to a shrink to get his input on it, you know? So, all I'm just trying to say is lighten up a little bit. It's basically about some of us need more tools than others. You may be able to do your entire sobriety within the confines of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's great. I have no, I mean, fine. I have nothing to say about that. I wish I could have. Saved me a lot of money. But that hasn't been my case. It hasn't been for me. Because one thing I must do, it's critical for me, is to continue to improve the quality of my life. If I do not improve the quality of my life, mentally, physically, and emotionally, I'm apt to get loaded again. That's the only thing that will send me out. You know? I've been through deaths and births and weddings and, you know... 
buried a lot of people. And my biggest regret probably is, is not friends of mine who have died um, from, you know, their livers went or have died from AIDS and sobriety, but the ten men I know who... Um, with more than nine years of sobriety blew their brains out because of these very issues and no one was there to help them with it. Um, you see, one of the things that happened to me, it, it was really interesting, it took me a long time to discover this. When I got to the amends step, my sponsors made a big deal out of it. You know, how this is it, this is the step that separates the men from the boys, and yeah, but, but, I mean, just, you know, you'll find the promises are after that. I mean, this, you know, this is it. It was really played up to me as this is it, the amends step. And I worked the amends step, and it was no fun for me, because I had hurt some people really badly, and they weren't even glad I was sober. They were actually were sorry I was alive. <laughs> so it wasn't a warm, heartfelt experience like many people were relating from the podium. But I made them anyway. So what my sponsors are saying to me and the book was saying to me is the consequences of my alcoholism is critical. That I deal with the consequences of my alcoholism. And I believe for me, my recovery basically has been in the early years it was about dealing with the consequences of my alcoholism. Going to meetings, sponsoring people, carrying panels, writing inventories, um, going to hospitals, making amends, you know, sending a lousy $5 checks off, you know, all that stuff. And then at 17, when I was completely off the chart, it became necessary for me to begin to deal with the consequences of what had been done to me. No longer what I had done to others, but now what had been done to me. And the thing that's interesting to me is you really can't have one without the other. You cannot tell me on one hand how critical the amend step is and that I deal with the consequences of my addiction. And then when I start to tell you about my childhood, how you say to me that that's not relevant because it was a long time ago. The consequences of what went on then are as critical as the consequences of my addiction. For me, you know. When am I supposed to quit? 9.30? Huh? Okay. Um, let's talk about um, marriages for a minute. <laughs> it is not difficult for anyone out there who has some information or perhaps a degree in psychology to understand from the short talk I've given why I had a rather difficult time in a marriage. And it's simply this. I was beaten senseless by a woman. And no one came to help, including my father. Okay? So, I don't mind women who are covertly angry. I like that, actually. That works. You know, that's a, that's a connection for both of us. It means we want to kill each other, but we won't admit to it. So it comes out sexually, and it usually works well for a while. <laughs> but... um if a woman is overtly angry, you know, like standing in my face, yelling and screaming and mad and changing colors and really loud, I am immediately emotionally reduced to a helpless two-year-old little boy who nobody's going to come help and is going to get hurt really bad. That's how I feel when that's going on. So my role in relationships came to make sure no one got that mad at me and if they did, to get rid of them. Covertly, I mean, I don't say it's over because then they'll get mad again and I have to deal with it. Just create an unbearable situation so that they will leave. You know? So that's what I did. So that's out of my history, you see? That all the marriages, all the money it cost me, all the emotional pain for all of us was a result of the history. It's what went on when I was a child. And I needed that information so I could fix the problem. You know? Now, I'm not married now, but the last marriage was for nine years. Considering all the others were 18 months, that's a, you know, a, an accomplishment. Also, I have a daughter who's nine years old now. This has been the greatest gift in sobriety. I, um, I can't go, I mean, I, you know, I could take all night to tell you how much I love this child. Um, I'll just finish with um, one story. Um, I used to go in her room and sit at night and look at her asleep in her crib and I would cry. 
because I was so overjoyed that she was in our lives. I mean, I was just so moved by her presence. And I used to hold her at times and just cry and weep because she was so magnificent to me. And I would tell her how glad I was she was my daughter and how glad I was she was a girl and how glad I was that she was with us. And she got older. We made sure that she understood she was planned and we wanted her and knew what we were doing and all that. <clears throat> this child's never been struck. Probably never will be struck. Never has been yelled at. And uh, yet when she and I were at cross purposes with each other, my immediate instinct was to double up my fist and to hit her in the corner of the eye. My immediate instinct. 30 years sober, done tons of recovery work in and out of the program, and my instinct is to hit her in the corner of the eye, right here. Why? Because it works. I know it works. It will stop her from doing what she's doing that I want her to stop, or it will make her do what I want her to do that she's not doing. Now, I learned to count to ten, so none of that ever happens. And if my wife and I had a deal. If we were, one of us was emotionally upset, we'd just go get the other one and, and turn the child over to the other one. And if both of us were nuts, we'd find a neighbor, you know, or, <laughs> or, or somebody else. Now, not only did I have trouble with that, and, and that's, that's learned behavior. I mean, that's one of the reasons people get up so upset at meetings. I mean, for those of you who are all into this childhood stuff and you wonder why people get so crazy when you start talking about your alcoholic father kicking the crap out of you, it's because the meeting you're in is filled with alcoholic fathers and, and who, who may or may not have done this work who may or may not have straightened it out with their kids. And so this is a bloated, dynamite issue. You know, I passed on to my children what was given to me. The only reason I didn't pass it on to this child is because I have more information. I have more tools now. So she didn't have to get it. The other side of it, which is really funny, is it's difficult for me to have fun, and it's hard for me, it was hard for me to let her have fun. An example was one time she was sitting in the bathtub, and I used the, you know, it was, I don't know how old she was, but however old she was, it was the books said, you know, you got to be in there with her. <laughs> one of you. <laughs> however old that is. And I always used the shrunken hand method, you know, to get her out of the tub. And when her hand started to shrink and shrivel, I knew it was time to get her out of the tub. <laughs> so she's sitting in the tub, and she indicates to me that she wants to bathe this pink stuffed kangaroo that's sitting on the by the sink next to me. My immediate response is, no, 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 no. You cannot bathe the stuffed kangaroo. My God, it's full of sawdust. The seams are going to split. It'll get all over the house. It'll never dry. It's going to be moldy and mildew. It's going to sneak up. You cannot bathe the kangaroo. <laughs> I thank my dear dead departed mother for her input on kangaroo bathing. <clears throat> Then I look at the kangaroo, look at my daughter, look at the kangaroo, look at my daughter, and I think, who the hell cares? <laughs> right? What does it matter? So I give her the kangaroo and a bottle of Johnson's baby shampoo. And within minutes, she and the kangaroo have disappeared from sight. <laughs> so I keep checking her hand. It starts to shrivel. I tell her it's time to get out. We take the kangaroo, rinse it under the faucet, wring it out. Down the hall to the laundry room we go. Open the dryer, throw the kangaroo in the dryer, close the door, set the timer, punch the button, turn it on, leave the laundry room. And we are leaving, my daughter and I, with two entirely different sets of energy. She's so happy she's off the chart. She can't wait to come back and get her kangaroo. I mean, she's just stoked because she knows it's going to be okay. <laughs> Dad, on the other hand, knows the only way the kangaroo is coming out of the dryer is with the dust buster, right? <laughs> I'm delighted to report 40 minutes later we opened the dryer door and there was a fluffy pink, very happy kangaroo sitting there waiting for us. So. So 
so it worked out. But it worked out because I'd gotten tools on how to raise a child, and I talked to people who were professionals about children and child rearing, and I'd read books on how you do it and how you don't shame them and how important it is that they never be hit under any circumstances. And so I could do it differently this time because I availed myself of the information. So all I'm trying to say to anybody here is that's me. That's my experience. And if your experience is, is you need more tools, you know, bless you, man. And I, you know, if you don't need, if you need permission, you've got mine. You know, you say, Bob Earl said I could go to the shrink. <laughs> the only danger I see with the people that take medication and been involved with the neurotransmitters and um, the go to therapy is that they replace the A with it. And that's not what it's about. These are tools in addition to. And actually, if you do decide to go out and go into therapy, I suggest that you sponsor a couple of people and get a commitment at your local meeting um, because it'll cut down the cost of your therapy for you. Um, so much shit will come up while you're sponsoring these people and working the commitment that it'll give you a lot to take in, you know, and to your therapist. So you may save a lot of dough. Um, I want to thank the committee for inviting me here. It's a great conference, a lot of sobriety in the room. That's great. It's very comforting. And God bless you all. Good night.